question, like is this thing rolling here? It's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Schutten, who uh, most who most of you are familiar with. Um, as I was teasing her a few minutes ago, she's a triple threat from the um, um, University of Wisconsin. She got her BS there, her DVM, and her PhD. Her PhD was in investigating the cellular origin of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma in mice. And I, of course, had the chance to get to work with her when she was a pathology resident at, uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And she spent some time here in Comparative Path before moving on to the industrial world of Genentech. And she is now a senior scientist, senior scientist, uh, senior scientist pathologist um, at that company, and uh, she is here interviewing for the comparative pathology position at the university. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Or interrupt in a second when we get the caffeine. Okay. Go right to it. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, and it's lovely to be here for an interview. So I, I appreciate that also. Um, so, uh, the focus of my talk is going to be on, uh, on drug development, but it's basically drug development in my eyes is comparative pathology in practice. So, um, I will uh, talk about kind of the bench to bedside part of, um, of my role uh, as we move um, drugs through the process uh, for human cancer development. So the traditional drug development process is really long and suffers from a pretty high rate of attrition. Um, sorry, I don't have a pointer or a clicker, but um, so so the um, where we start uh, in the whole drug development process is um, is pre-discovery. So this is uh, where researchers will have a target of interest that they think plays a role in a, a specific. Uh, indication and my role is most my role and my interest is mostly cancer biology and cancer therapeutics so I'll be a little bit focused on that today um, so research identifies a target they um, may want to investigate not only the role of that of drugging that target in terms of efficacy but they certainly um, you know the flip side of that coin is toxicity <coughs> so what where I'll get involved or where veterinary pathologists and industry get involved with in this space is um, helping to characterize the target organs that are affected by um, knocking out or inhibiting a certain gene of interest. So we do a lot of genetically engineered mouse models, knockout, knockdown rat model, phenotyping. So <coughs> this varies a little bit in terms of small molecule or large molecule. Um, but in a small molecule space, there's a lot of um, small molecule screening that happens, natural product screening, that's a lot of, done a lot by automation in computational, in silico um, uh, lead, optimis lead hits, uh, they call it. So that is, it's thousands of hits that they run through. And um, when they get either the structure that they're interested in, um, and we'll do in silico analysis to see if there are any um, flags that are blatantly um, genotoxic or um, cytotoxic for a, for a non-oncology indication. And they'll winnow those out. Uh, and so we'll be back down to um, something in several hundreds. Um, our job then is to take all of those like several hundred hits and, and winnow them down again to um, maybe three <laughs> um, lead candidates. And so the, the small molecule space will have um, maybe about 10 that they select from and move one forward with a couple of backups. Um, I'm primarily a large molecule person, so in the antibody world, um, we'll have maybe one, usually two candidates that we'll select from. So once we have, you can see down here, this is the, the timeline um, that we're working with. So it's. Um, usually three to six years um, and uh, a significant amount of investment by the company uh, and once we have uh, our lead molecule then we run all those IND enabling studies so IND is investigational new drug uh, it is <coughs> um, there are regulatory guidances from different um, world health authorities so the FDA of course is one that we work very closely with those guidances help us to develop 
um, the strategy, the, the length of study that we have to um, conduct in order to support a first in human dose. And in the oncology world, there's a lot more good or bad. There's a lot more um, toler um, tolerance for toxicity um, because we're often going into an end stage uh, scenario where standard of care has failed um, patients. So I still stay on these projects, we still stay on these projects as they go through clinical trials um, and then of course uh, depending on the indication you're in um, you may actually skip phase two trials and in oncology we try and do that because we're trying to get these drugs to market as fast as possible and you can do it with a limited number of patients. Oh my god my talk is here. <laughs> So much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Charlie. Okay. So um, this again is a lengthy process. Just out of, um, of interest, when you're when we're developing a drug, say for diabetes or cardiovascular um, indications, this phase three trial can be five to ten years long because they need tens of thousands of patients around the world. Um, we submit then our NDA or biologics um, uh, licensing application, uh, it goes through FDA review, et cetera, and then we finally get this thing marketed. So it's a, usually the fastest scenario for even cancer drugs, it's traditional antibodies or small molecules is, oh, thank you, um, is, uh, yes, okay. um, is, uh, is 10 years. And, um, I'm so heavily involved with this space. I lead a project that is an antibody drug conjugate for AML. And just running these preclinical trials has been $25 million. So it's significant. <laughs> so um, this, I thought, is a nice schematic just to uh, reiterate how um, you know, a lot of companies invest a ton of money in research uh, to get what we think is the best molecule to patients. Uh, and we want to be able to, of course, bring the best candidate to preclinical studies to stack odds in our favor of actually getting this thing approved. So this schematic came out of the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development um, about five years ago. And it goes all the way from the early 60s until 2014, showing um, the new approvals that either the, we call these new molecular entities, so that could be anything, basically, that's approved for patient use. Uh, and these little black dots, and the R&D expenditures are, of course, like exponential. So the MME and the, the MBE approvals really hasn't, it's gotten better, but it's, I think, pretty disproportionate to the amount of spend. Um, so of course, people in the, in the industry are always trying to come up with new models and more creative ways to, uh, again, stack the odds in our favor that we can move a candidate successfully all the way to marketing. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, questions? of course. Yeah. On the previous slide, uh -huh. as, you, as you should iterate now, um, I mean, I could sort of do the math, I guess, if many, you know, sort of fail, not fail, but like fall out of the pipeline between discovery and clinical. Are there other points along that pipeline where you sort of lose? Yeah. Like the percentage of losses is our spike in certain, like certain columns of this process. Yeah. So. Um, we will sometimes spend a lot of time in this preclinical space um, trying to find a lead molecule that, again, shows activity with a good safety profile. So usually most things, if we do kill things at this standpoint, at, at this point, if the tox is really bad. Um, but I would say it's pretty successful getting through preclinical trials to file an IND. Um, I would say phase one, for oncology, we kill things because of lack of activity. Um, and actually, a project I'm going to talk about now is was killed for that very reason. And then phase three is where the other attrition is, and that also is usually for lack of activity. Um, I think we do a pretty, the industry does a pretty good job of, if you can anticipate, if the, if the toxicity translates between animals to humans, we identify that well. It's the when you get into the thousands of patients where you may get the idiosyncratic toxicities or toxicities that um, happen in patients with other diseases. Yeah, so, yeah. So the practice of drug development, um, I've learned, or this is sort of my philosophy about it, is that 
Um, it really involves uh, three things. So it's definitely science. Um, there's a lot of strategy, uh, and, and drug development's a pretty risky operation. So um, you have to be able to work with the limited amount of data you have uh, and look ahead to see how your molecule you're trying to develop um, may fit into the competitive landscape where the standard of care may be changing. And you're trying to anticipate that you know, five years, eight years down the road. Um, and so there's a lot, we work together with a lot of different functions to try and take smart risks. And when it works well, then we've got success. So um, I want to talk about a project that I've been working on, um, basically a, a platform I've been working on for about well, basically since I came to Gen Z. <laughs> um, so it's been nine years. Um, and I hope that this kind of illustrates how comparative pathology really plays a significant role in um, preclinical drug development and getting into the clinic. So my focus, a lot of my time has been spent working on antibody drug conjugates uh, at Genentech. And, and Genentech's an antibody company, so they have a lot of expertise in this. So just so we orient everybody with what these molecules are, um, an antibody drug conjugate or an ADC, which I'll refer to it as, is a pretty complex molecule. So it's a hybrid of um, a large molecule, uh, often a standard IgG antibody, that is conjugated through a, a linker through to a very potent um, cytotoxic molecule. So there are properties of the antibody drug conjugate that can lend itself well to um, efficacy and can also um, play a real significant role in the toxicity and the kinds of toxicity you get. So when we think about designing these drugs from the, the get-go, we have certain properties that we want to um, uh, tweak. So uh, we need the antibody to actually bind to the antigen on the cell surface. We need that antigen to be expressed uh, on the cell surface, usually um, uh, pretty highly on the tumor, limited expression on normal tissue, uh, although that's difficult. <laughs> and uh, of course we need that antibody to actually get into the cell uh, once it's bound. And because we're adding all of these drugs to the antibody, that could potentially change the pharmacokinetic profile um, or the way that it's cleared through the body, and um, so we need the antibody to maintain kind of its normal um, properties. So if you have a 15, 150,000 kilodalton yeah. uh, IgG, yeah. how big is the molecule compared to that? How big is the I mean, weight-wise, I mean, can you have a massive, relatively massive molecule chemical that's attached to the antibody and it works, or is, is there a weight ratio that needs to be maintained there there's that not, be effective? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's not, like the antibody really drives most of the PK properties of, of the molecule, and it's not, the drugs don't necessarily affect, like you can put lots and lots of drugs for example, of varying molecular weights on this antibody. If you put a lot of drugs on there, um, it may cause more rapid clearance, but the antibody still gets in, it still does its thing, it doesn't necessarily affect that activity. Does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah, that's my question. Is. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there are technologies now, actually for infectious disease, where they're starting to use this for like staph infections, and they want to load, you know, they want to, get as much antibiotic intracellular, you know, to kill intracellular staph, and so they will put 22 drugs or something on here. Yeah. So di different drugs. Different drugs, yeah, yeah. like, um, you know, antibiotic derivatives, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, so you can use this technology for things other than cancer, but uh, in terms of cancer, then we use a highly potent cytotoxic drug that can be um, either a microtubule inhibitor like vincristine or something that's a DNA damaging agent like boxerubicin. And just for context, um, the molecules that we're working with at Genentech are um, like two to 5,000 times more potent than doxorubicin. So they're like picogram potencies. 
directed. No, no, no. <laughs> That's the goal, right? Yes. That's the goal. Yes. That's the goal. But so because these are so cytotoxic, um, you really need a stable linker to, to tether that um, small molecule to the antibody so that you don't get release of the driving systemic circulation. So we spend a lot of time um, engineering that. So each of these each of these components can affect the behavior of the molecule and certainly the overall toxicity profile. But the promise of ADCs is really that we want to improve upon standard um, cytotoxic chemotherapy that's you know, delivered systemically that is not necessarily targeted or is targeted to all um, you know, rapidly proliferating cells, et cetera. So this is a nice schematic, again, that kind of shows this. You always talk about therapeutic window, which is the, um, uh, and this window, there's space between um, our efficacious dose, or our minimally efficacious dose, and then our maximum tolerated dose. So it's super narrow in standard chemotherapy, if not potentially non-existent. Um, and so the thought with ADCs is that we can really widen that deliver targeted chemotherapy and at a much um, safer dose with less toxicities. So um, so how do these things work? So um, there are basically two sort of uh, modes of action uh, for ADCs. It's either um, target directed uh, or bystander effect, we call it. So again, we've got uh, an antibody that is uh, that specifically bind an antigen on this cell surface of a tumor. Once it's bound, it's internalized uh, into the cell, trafficks to the lysosome, is degraded, that, that tight linker is degraded based on um, intracellular cathepsins, other proteases, etc. cetera. Uh, the toxin is released and um, induces cell death, however the MOA of that, of that payload is um, directed. Bystander effect is where you get binding of the um, antibody drug conjugate to the cell surface. Um, for some reason, this is the, the tethered payload is cleaved in systemic circulation. If this little guy is um, able to be freely permeable through the cell membrane, then it can get intracellular and kill these cells. And this is something, I think it's important to remember for the rest of this talk that this happens. So even though we think antibody drug conjugates are targeted, there's still non-specific toxicity that happens unrelated to the antigen. So that brings me to um, how these can be toxic, some of which I already talked about. So there can be systemic release of the toxin either from this linker not being tight enough or having some sort of systemic um, instability, metabolism, or breakdown of, of the whole ADC in, in circulation can also be an issue. And then unwanted um, antigen dependent ADC mediated cytotoxicity. So you get this ADC again binding to an antigen on the cell surface that maybe that antigen is expressed on normal tissues. Uh, there can be off target. Um, off target binding to normal tissues. And there's also all those FC mediated and pinocytosis um, mediated ways uh, in which antibodies can get taken up and this whole process can occur in those cells. So ADCs are they're really not a new technology um, and we've been working on them since the 90s. And so this is just a, um, a xenograph data from uh, one of our food drugs, which is called Catsila. It's um, basically a Herceptin or a HER2 antibody that's conjugated to microtubule inhibitor DM1. So in a, this is a Founder 5 memory tumor um, model. And here we're looking at a single IV dose and then over time um, looking at tumor volume. So when we're looking at the conjugate, this uh, TD1 ADC, can see after a single dose that there is um, tumor stasis uh, versus looking at, um, so when we do these experiments, the way we try and do them is so that the amount of payload that we're delivering as a free unconjugated drug is matched to the antibody drug conjugate, so it's a pretty even experiment in terms of um, payload cytotoxicity. So we can see that the ADC is, um, is better tolerated uh, 
it's not better tolerated. It has more um, efficacy than the free D1 at the same concentration. So the flip side, of course, of efficacy is tolerability. And so this is um, often, uh, in early stages, we'll use body weights as a crude way of evaluating uh, tolerability. And so what this graph is showing is, um, again, time zero where we've delivered, I guess day one, when we've delivered uh, a single dose of this uh, antibody drug conjugate to rats. And we're looking at um, body weight percent change from baseline. So again, at matched uh, microgram per meter squared of drug load, uh, this red line shows that animals really didn't tolerate this drug very well and had to be the nice four days post-dose. Whereas um, here, there's a little bit of a dip in body weight um, from some tolerability issues, but those animals continue to gain weight and tolerate the ADC much better. And the same trend um, holds true with uh, monkeys with this drug. So these are just kind of general concepts to lay out um, ADCs in general. And so now I'll, oh, the color is super funky. <laughs> um, Sorry to the pathologist whose minds are like trying to adjust the H and E. Um, so Genentech had um, a microtubule inhibiting drug that was conjugated to HER2 that I just mentioned called um, Catsyla. And we were interested in making a next generation of ADC that uses a DNA damaging agent. And part of the reason that we wanted to do that is because you know patients develop resistance to microtubule inhibitors or um, DNA damaging agents like an anthracycline derivative may be more clinically validated for different types of um, cancer indications. So we did a lot of work in screening out uh, different free payloads that we wanted to conjugate to an antibody and then looking at what the toxicity profiles of those kind of lead molecules were in both rats and monkeys. So the next few slides will show you um, the anatomic pathology from those early studies. So, um, <coughs> so this is data from a single dose uh, uh, injected into a rat, and we wanted to get a sense of what uh, the payload driven, the free drug driven toxicities were versus the antibody drug conjugate. So this uh, photomicrograph is a bone marrow from a control rat. Um, so this is nice normal bone marrow, very cellular with all of the um, lineage components present. Um, this, in contrast, is a section of marrow from an animal that was given um, just the unconjugated free drug, and so it basically ablates the marrow. They're um, pancytopenic, and they don't tolerate it very well, but when you conjugate the same amount of free drug to an antibody, you can see that there's still, there's hypocellularity, um, and there's, uh, on the path, there's neutropenia, as the prom, um, predominant uh, hematology change, but it looks pretty, it looks a lot better, obviously, <laughs> than the payload, and like very, but it looks better. Uh, so that we identified bone marrow toxicity. Um, the next thing we identified was renal tubular degeneration. Um, again, a normal kidney from a rat. This is the free drug, uh, a photomicrograph of um, the lesion from a rat given the free drug with a little bit of, sorry these are so small, but um, there's some degree of tubular degeneration, but a lot of, in some cast formation in the tubules uh, and lots of congestion, but the animals um, didn't have any chemistries, uh, abnormalities associated with this. However, when we conjugate it to the antibody, um, you could, this is a nice example where you've got um, epithelial uh, degeneration um, and loss, uh, in the tubules, there's some little protein droplets uh, and um, tubular uh, dilation as well. So um, we, oh, this was so big. We um, <laughs> did a lot of studies then, you know, really trying to characterize the bone marrow and the kidney toxicity. But as we were um, playing around with linkers a little bit, we started to see. Uh, get reports back from the technicians that animals had, um, rats had perinasal swelling, swelling behind their neck, um, and some swollen paws. Um, and so on histopathology, 
so we weren't expecting that. But on histopathology, then, um, this is the data that we got from those studies. So this, again, is a normal hind limb from a control rat. And we had, um, <coughs> we were worried at the time that the finding may be related to a specific antibody. So we used several different antibodies that cross-reacted with rat, but where the antigen should not be in any of these tissues. So what we see is that um, the swelling is really a lot of sub-Q swelling, uh, and um, there's some synovial uh, inflammation, um, fiber accumulation, et cetera. So there was a lot, again, we were characterizing this joint and soft tissue swelling. And this is more examples of that. This is uh, a section of skin from the back, again, showing a, a pretty significant amount of sub-Q edema, edema um, around the nose, and then on higher magnification, um, again, just more edema. And some of these vessels look like almost like ghost vessels. Like the endothelium is um, lost or, or necrotic. And there's a, kind of a posse cellular mixed cell infiltrate. At the same time, we started to do uh, take our lead molecules and put them into monkeys. <coughs> um, in single and repeat dose studies to characterize uh, whether or not the Toxicities we identified in rats would translate um, to, to sinos. Uh, and we used sinos for our program because the, the antigen, because the antibody actually cross reacted with the antigen in monkeys, and therefore using monkey studies would be considered by the FDA a, a pharmacologically relevant species so that you actually can characterize the toxicity um, in a species that would be relevant to humans. So um, what we saw in those animals is the same bone marrow and kidney toxicity and also the same soft tissue pathology. So there's some saponous vein uh, injection site changes, um, uh, which of course could be related to extravization of drug. But the thing that really caught our attention was the fact that away from the injection site, um, these animals had, again, the same soft tissue um, edema necrosis, like this is, this is just basically necrotic um, soft tissue. And it was occurring on places like the chest, the face, um, eyelids, so it's, uh, it was unusual. Um, also in these monkeys, there was lung pathology that was present. Um, and so what that lung pathology was, it, it sort of spanned anything from kind of minimal increases in um, foamy macrophages in the alveolar spaces, to things that looked like this, which actually um, translated into a gross pathology lesion, where there's more um, degenerate cells, um, fibrin in some sections, alveolar edema, and um, the alveolar septal walls were sort of um, widened. It almost looked like there was some necrotic material or fibrin in, in some sections. So um, putting all of this together with what we knew about the limited data that we knew about um, DNA damaging agents, we started to piece together the soft tissue lesions, maybe these lung lesions, uh, and again, stuff we knew from literature, and we're characterizing this as, as vascular leak syndrome or capillary leak syndrome, which can be seen with um, Lots of chemotherapeutics, but uh, anthracycline derivatives are certainly one of them. So vascular leak syndrome is a is a rare disorder characterized by systemic capillary leakage. Um, it's a sudden reversible capillary hyperpermeability. You obviously got um, uh, you can have um, pretty profound edema in limbs, also in um, Third spaces like the pleural, um, pleural effusions and um, pericardial effusions, et cetera. And then, of course, when you have lots of edema and you're losing protein, um, you've got all the sequelae that follow that. So, um, again, because we knew this was a DNA damaging agent, we um, were talking with clinicians about. Um, whether or not they also agreed that this was capillary leakiness, um, whether or not the clinicians wanted to actually take these molecules to develop them, because we're trying to make drugs that are better <laughs> and less yeah. less toxic and better tolerated. And um, 
in monkeys, in some studies, we had to take animals down because of pericardial effusions, um, ascites. So it, it really manifested in spaces that were certainly clinically undesirable. Um, and the mechanism by which these ADCs were causing this um, were not necessarily known. So now what happens? <laughs> Yeah. So, in, and this may there may be industry-wide perspectives or maybe gen tech-specific perspectives on this, but you sort of showed all this data in parallel. Yeah. Are those studies run in parallel, or are they run in sequence? And so, what I'm curious to know is that, given the pathology you saw in the mice, which yeah. the mice in fact, which I presume yeah. preceded the non human yeah. studies, you mentioned sort of kill points along this yeah. process, which is a exceptionally dramatic term, which I sort of appreciate, but like. <laughs> Balancing sort of cost and the need to move quickly and get things through, like, would any of that pathology that you saw in the mice said, let's not move into primates because those are expensive and timely? Like, what are what yeah. are some like kill metrics that you have um, along that process? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Um, so they always start with efficacy studies, um, and <coughs> we'll compare the new, you know, our, our candidate of interest to say standard of care in the same models, and so if we think there's an improvement, that's like step one, to move into talks. Um, then rodents are always our first pass screening animal, and we'll always do those before we do any primate or dog work. Um, and so, like, our job is to identify toxicity, and so it is, even though we have all these toxicities, we move forward with this because when you compare, again, it goes back to that TI slide. So if we've got this minimally efficacious dose and we have a rat maximum tolerated dose, and say there's um, a 10x window uh, between those two doses, then that window is o okay to move forward, depending on the toxicity. Sure. So if this was neurotoxicity, it would be end game. If it was heart toxicity, same thing. Also, like, we don't want to make people blind, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, so, um, so we have had points where, where that's, where either our, our therapeutic window collapses and it's one, or we don't have one, or you've got toxicities in organs that we just can't monitor. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that brings me to this, which is how do we actually oh, yeah. decide to move forward, yeah, with right. the therapeutic <laughs> molecule, yeah. So there's kind of a mantra in industry, and that is, um, is the lesion monitorable? Like, do the clinicians have um, something they can use from clin clinical pathology or imaging uh, such that they can hopefully monitor and stop treatment before it gets worse? Is it reversible? Um, and sometimes the pathologists will run studies to actually try and suss this out. Other times we're asked to make that reversibility call without the actual reversibility time frame, which is difficult. <laughs> um, do we think it's going to be translatable to humans? Uh, it helps quite a bit. You know, if you've got two species that have the same kinds of lesions and we, and we think the biology is conserved across species to human, then it's a much easier call. But if, say, rats have a certain kidney lesion and monkeys don't, we're not sure how humans will be sensitive to it, then it becomes more difficult. Um, and then again, is it clinically manageable? So we look at all these things, but at the end, if even one of these fails, we still think that um, taking in context risk benefit uh, for patients is the way that we help drive these decisions forward. So quickly, um, you know, we identified all of this toxicity um, with this platform, but our company was really interested in moving these forward because they still saw an unmet medical need uh, in cancer therapeutics. So we wanted to understand vascular leak toxicity to either go back, to either inform the antibody engineers how to engineer these antibodies better, um, the chemists potentially modify the, the payload, um, and then for the pathologists and the toxicologists to be able to have a conversation with clinicians about um, ways to potentially monitor this. So um, I covered a little bit of that right now, but we, again, there are ways that you can engineer the antibody to decrease nonspecific uptake, and that's through this FC region, so you can modify that so it's not, it doesn't bind um, as well to um, FC gamma or FCRN 
receptors on cells, and those are everywhere uh, in the body. Because the, again, the business end of the molecule is up here, so we don't need this necessarily for efficacy. Um, we can also potentially change the linker chemistry to improve stability because we wondered if the, if the payload was falling off in systemic circulation. And then we um, also took the tack of um, pro-drugging the payload so that it's essentially inert until it gets into a cell and then is um, enzymatically, the, the pro-drug part is enzymatically cleaved and then this um, giving an active drug. So this was going on with animal experiments and in vitro experiments, and at the same time, um, we were running the, in the investigative tox group um, uh, these studies. So we wanted to characterize the histopathology of the lesion. Um, you could tell based on h &E that it looked like endothelial necrosis and lots of edema, but uh, we wanted to characterize, again, sort of concentrations of, of um, drug in the interstitial space um, do a panel of immunohistochemical stains for apoptosis, necrosis, and DNA damage. And then we labeled the drug, um, uh, we did immunogold EM to actually follow uh, the labeled drug into uh, see if it was actually getting out of systemic circulation into the interstitium. Uh, our investigative talks group did a bunch of uh, work looking at safety biomarker, so the only change we saw in ClinPath was albumin decreases uh, and some elevations in C-reactive protein. So those are pretty non-specific. Uh, and the industry doesn't really have a good way of helping, there are no real good vascular biomarkers that are um, available that translate from our tox species to humans. So there's a whole in, um, predictive safety testing consortium that's working on those now. So we were working on microRNAs and some of these new safety biomarkers for that, and then we wanted to look at tissue concentrations of our drug, um, both in, like I said, in tissues and then serum concentration. So we played around with linker chemistries, um, knowing, expecting that there may be differences in the tox profile if we made the linkers very cleavable so that the that payload is released readily, uh, or if we made that tether really, really tight so that the whole antibody had to be broken up into chunks <coughs> for the, um, uh, and allow more exposure to the, the payload. So, um, so what you're looking at here is uh, the green is, the green relates to the, the most cleavable um, linker type. The red here relates to the most stable or uncleavable linker type. So I'd pay attention to those. This is uh, hematology and chemistry parameters that we looked at, which are pretty typical and related back to the toxicities uh, that we had seen in various target organs. So um, this is from a rat study. So you can see this actually should be day, it shouldn't be dose. Um, but you, um, so white cell counts tank from um, day five to day 10. Uh, and as to platelets with the very cleavable linkers. Um, transaminase in the liver goes up and BUN um, also goes up with the cleavable linkers. Uh, uncleavable linkers seem to be, the, the same toxicities um, were still there, but uh, they didn't come on until much later. So this was just, you know, it kind of gave us a little bit more security thinking that yes, if you have a very cleavable linker, that payload's gonna come off fast and cause toxicity faster. Um, but we really didn't want either of these scenarios. We wanted something that was sort of in the middle um, because the uncleavable linker also had um, a central nervous system and peripheral nervous system toxicity. So this was another thing that we steered away from. So the chemist went back and made um, uh, a more stable linker for us, but not too stable. <laughs> One other thing that we played around from a with in a tox standpoint is um, how can we modify the dose regimen to improve tolerability? Uh, and this is something that um, I think is used pretty widely depending on what drug you're using in the clinic. So one way, we wondered if this drug was driven by the maximum concentration, um, the Cmax uh, concentration uh, of drug uh, initially at delivery. This is in systemic circulation 
or is it driven by overall exposure or AUC to the drug? Um, each of those parameters can drive different toxicities, so we wanted to just get a better handle on whether or not dose fractionating, decreasing your Cmax, but maintaining your overall exposure to the drug could help um, mitigate this vascular toxicity. So what we did was take, uh, we ran a rat study, it was a, um, taking a single dose of our ADC and then fractionating that 4.5 mix per kg in, in over three doses um, uh, Q-weekly. So, so again, you can see this is the toxicokinetic um, plasma, uh, plasma concentrations. So Cmax is blunted uh, when you dose fractionate um, AUC, we'll look at AUC 0 to 28, um, those are pretty well matched. So what we saw is looking at body weight gain um, from a single dose, the animals definitely lose weight. Uh, it seems to be better tolerated with less uh, weight loss um, with the fraction of the dose versus control versus, um, uh, versus the single dose. This is an initial count. And so again, we're looking at the single dose here. Um, this is uh, seven days post dose. Um, the same for day 15. And you can see that uh, the single dose had much more uh, decreases in neutrophils versus the fractionated dose. So it did seem to improve um, the severity of neutropenia and the other hematologic changes that we looked at. But these animals still develop vascular leak syndrome. So that told us that perhaps the um, toxicity is then driven by overall exposure and not, it won't be helped by blunting our CMAX. Okay, so it's been a long, <laughs> long and winding road through all sorts of um, toxicities and trying to understand mechanisms and um, you're really left with trying to figure out if you have a path over here to actually develop your drug into a specific indication. So this is where really like the strategy comes in for um, figuring out if, if the molecule you have and all of its assorted data can get you to where you need to go. So um, I have led a pharmacology sub-team where we uh, looked with clinicians and research to find an indication where we thought that this, these ABCs would actually meet an unmet medical need. So this, where um, our group landed with these ADCs is for one indication to treat acute myeloid leukemia. So this is uh, a neoplasm of myeloid precursors. It um, occurs in older patients. Uh, it has a poor prognosis. The standard of care has not changed for many, many years. Um, and there's real room to improve on it because if you're not fit for, in because induction therapy, which is seven plus three, um, is really rough uh, and a lot of there's a significant amount of patients that don't make it through this induction therapy or honestly make it even to treatment because the disease by the time you're diagnosed is, um, is pretty advanced. So what we thought is uh, we could potentially take our ADC and replace donorubicin because we have another anthracycline derivative. We also knew in looking from the literature that if you can, um, this is from New England Journal of Medicine, looking at AML patients and survival, if you could intensify the amount of anthracycline treatment that you gave these patients, they tended to do better But um, than given their standard dose. But of course, there's toxicities associated with intensifying that anthracycline. Um, but given what we know about AML and the um, in our drug, we really felt like this was, we could again replace anthracycline as part of seven plus three. Uh, we thought um, we could deliver a very small amount of this molecule and conjugate it to uh, you know, an antigen that's expressed highly on blasts and, um, and avoid, there was a window between when we could get efficacy and toxicity. Yeah, and again, part of the strategy was also to pick the right antigen that we were going to direct our antibody against. And so we 
as in all things with drug development, there's a lot of com com competition, and there was a lot of competition in AML because there's such a need for new drugs in that space. So we had a competitor, Seattle Genetics, that uh, is also an antibody drug conjugate company that had a CD33 um, ADC that they were developing for AML also. Um, CD33 is expressed on uh, monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, and um, hematopoietic stem cells. And we knew from some data in the clinic that patients had really, really prolonged pancytopenias such that their thrombocytopenia went out 16 weeks and needed a lot of um, platelet transfusions. They also had some pretty significant infections. So we believe that our drug um, conjugated to a different molecule, which is a different antigen, which is called CLL1, expressed on, again, myeloid cells, uh, high AML prevalence, but not any uh, HSC expression would be safer than our competitor. Um, again, because there's so much blast in the periphery, we could um, give a very small amount of drug uh, to these patients uh, and hopefully have it be efficacious without tox. So, um, that molecule entered phase one trials. Uh, we treated about 20 patients. Um, and for whatever reason, which is going to be something I work on when I get back home, um, we haven't seen any activity. So, uh, it's been eight years in the making. Um, a lot of data that really led us to a point where we thought we would have something that could potentially really move the needle on AML treatment, but uh, I think this illustrates not only all the hard work that comparative pathology and all the other groups put into this and all the money, but also, you know, the journey to potentially disappointment <laughs> along the way. Um, so when we look at all this data, uh, we look at, you know, I've showed you all these, all this animal data and in vitro data that we've generated in the time and the amount of money it's taken to get here, can we disrupt the traditional drug development paradigm to bring safe drugs to patients faster? And there's a lot of people in the industry, of course, that are looking into this. Genentech, of course, is one of them. So I've broken it down into um, trying to develop more predictive in vitro screening tools to eliminate um, drugs that are toxic uh, and, and select for those that we think will be better tolerated. So we have in our, toxic, in our toxicology lab, we're starting to use more organs on a chip or microphysiological systems to do some uh, in vitro screening for, um, for toxicity and also starting to um, explore that for efficacy. Um, there's definitely a need for better models of disease um, and cancer treatment. So traditionally we've used these um, uh, xenograph models, which are basically just human cell lines injected in the flank of a mouse. And um, I don't think it's a stretch to think that that's not necessarily physiologically, you know, biologically relevant to a, a patient. So one, in, you know, one step that we've taken is to use patient-derived um, tumors, which have some degree of stroma um, and vasculature that we can implant into mice, but it's still not, you know, it's still in the flank of a mouse. <coughs> So we also use genetically engineered mouse models, um, again, have their own limitations. Uh, and as you guys know, um, being in the veterinary hospital and veterinary school, um, there are, you know, animals get cancer. So in dogs, we have things that get cancer are sharing our environment, have some, you know, cancers have very similar biological behavior, genetics, et cetera. So there's, quite a few companies, including Genentech, that are starting to explore the use of dogs and, and trying to use them along the way as we develop um, new drugs for patients. And then this is out of scope for what I do for a living, but um, there's a lot of efforts to design clinical trials so that they're streamlined, you can um, cast a wider net to different cancer indications uh, rather than just limit uh, to one specific indication. So a lot of um, novel clinical trial design. So I'm gonna focus on this and talk a little bit about comparative oncology and how um, we at Genentech are thinking about comparative on 
and how we can use it to accelerate cancer drug development for humans. So um, <coughs> this figure has been taken out of Melissa Paoloni's paper over and over. <laughs> I've just seen it like at all these conferences, <coughs> but it's great. Um, so, uh, and it illustrates the point really well. Um, you know, we've got all these preclinical models, which are normal animals that we use again, both in terms of trying to find uh, in, a, in evaluating efficacy and toxicity in the standard drug development paradigm, and it's very linear and, and long. But if we, and there are limitations to these models, and sometimes these, um, it's difficult to assess efficacy um, or a pharmacodynamic response in these, these normal animals. So if we can use companion animals that have, we can use dogs that have certain kinds of cancers, um, say urothelial carcinoma that have BRAF mutations, and we want to use a BRAF inhibitor <coughs> to help us select a potential dose for a human clinical trial, which could decrease the amount of escalations we have to do in a phase one trial, or even help <coughs> us um, to identify uh, the pharmacokinetics, um, again, to help us identify a dose um, or combinability of these different small molecules together. Dogs are a great model um, to help us get a lot of information to move into humans faster. Um, and in the best case scenario, um, inform veterinary oncology. So um, there's a kind of a rogue group of veterinary oncologists <laughs> in our group that uh, have been um, called socializing this uh, concept throughout Genentech. And I think it's gotten a lot of traction over the last few years. So each of us, you know, we're all the pathologists are on different project teams. Um, and I'm on a project team that has a small molecule inhibitor that is marketed for basal cell carcinoma and we're starting to look at pediatric indications. Um, there is a lot of pressure from regulatory agencies, the FDA in particular, saying drug companies have to look at all their molecules in their portfolio and see if there's a potential indication for kids because no one really, it's very, <coughs> people shy away from developing drugs for kids for a variety of reasons. Um, so we thought based on the biology of our molecule that it, it could really have um, uh, potential efficacy in osteosarc and of course you guys also know that canine osteosarcoma is a really lovely model in, for human osteosarcoma in terms of the genetics, the biological behavior, um, and I think these two things illustrate that um, nicely. So I've got a partner um, that we're gonna, we just started a contract and, and hopefully you're gonna start a, a clinical trial in dogs um, using the small molecule inhibitor. Again, to um, help us gain some confidence and efficacy before we would move into um, kids. There are challenges that have come up along the way, and I think it's, I thought it was would be relevant to bring this up here um, so that you guys know that from an industry standpoint, like we're very, people are very interested in using comparative oncology for human drug development, but we really all hopefully can work together to um, get a much better understanding of the genomics and mutational load from these different dog cancers because we want we, like the industry, wants to know that um, it's a relevant model. We're actually drugging the right um, pathway. There's a lag um, or a lack sometimes of uh, canine-specific tools. I think this has gotten better over the last few years, but immunology is one of those areas. Um, immunotherapy is one area that we work a lot in, and, and some of the canine-specific uh, antibodies are either not, they don't exist or they're lacking. So my last slide is just to say that um, you know I work in a realm where we use comparative pathology all the time in identifying all these toxicities between different species, uh, how they hopefully can inform, how they do inform um, the, the progression of cancer drug development um, for kids. Hopefully that translates back in some scenario to dogs, in that all of these 
things, the in vitro models, um, models in animals and models in kids, it all kind of falls back into this One Health um, movement. And then lastly, my slide is just to sh say that um, I work with people from all over research and development, um, all the way from manufacturing to legal and formulations, and so everything's very project driven and it's a lot of really awesome people that I get to work with. That's it. Let's take questions. This is, a, this is a statue of the founders of Genentech, and apparently they basically founded the company over a pitcher of beer in a bar in San Francisco. And so it's um, Herb Boyer and um, Bob Swanson that, that did that, and so there's this funny little statue on campus with a little antibody. <laughs> So, um, on a commercial side, has there been discussion about the use of artificial intelligence and in slide reading and that type of thing? Have Very much discussion? so. Um, to do some of the work and then flag issues that then use the pathologist. Yeah. I can't imagine there's a replace for the pathologist in terms of helping with the science of what's going on. But yeah. is, there, is there a serious move in that direction? Yes. Yeah, there is. And there's, um, we're right now, I'm part of a group at work that is evaluating a lot of technologies that we could bring in-house to do that kind of work for us. So it's early days, but they're like we just finished evaluating a company that's claimed that they can look at a bunch of different organs and flag normal and abnormal. Um, we, we tested it out, it's got room for improvement. But there is, so I have mixed feelings about <laughs> all of this, but uh, People outside of pathology, and even some of the pathologists think, you know, these, for context, this is not one slide or 25 slides that we're looking at on these studies. I mean, I had a carcinogenicity study where I peer reviewed 10% of the slides, and that was 11,000 slides that I read over. Yeah, and so that, you know, that's not typical, but the normal tox study may have, a rodent study may have, um, Hundred and you know eighty animals and thirty tissues per animal. And so if you in pathology is always the rate limiting step for the data, and they need it to file. So it's like if we could do that faster, that would be great. Um, so yes, that's where the that's where industry path is. There's a big push for that. I was talking to Jerry about this earlier, and I've, I've really gotten involved because I've again back to the mixed feelings thing, but I feel like we need, pathologists need to get involved so that they can influence where, how it's used and how it's developed. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are some really- But not a diagnostic lab show, right? <laughs> no. There's a paper a gentleman and I just published in Toxpath where um, we, he, we, he developed um, <laughs> this uh, deep learning algorithm to identify ovarian toxicity in rat ovaries. And so that's been great because you know, ovaries are kind of a messy, heterogeneous um, organ and rats cycle so fast that sometimes it can be difficult across 200 animals to kind of, other than counting corpulutia, sometimes it's, you know, it's nice to have uh, quantitative method to back up what the pathologist thinks they're seeing. So that's, we, we just developed that and published on it and hope that like, we're going to start implementing that in-house. But but that took years in the making. So you, you do a lot of computer morphology as well with that? We do a lot of, um, yeah, so um, we've got three image, full-time imaging scientists in our group and so they'll develop, like I have a, an ocular program where I was interested in trying to measure um, segments of the retina and the thickness of different segments of the retina and um, so rather than me like measuring all those things like the magical machine and algorithm people <laughs> did that and it was tremendously helpful yeah yeah because there are things you know we're the ones that end up still having the final say which is good um, but the machines can offer a lot of there's power in that. That's yeah. 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 
Can I ask a stupid question about the drug development? Yeah. Just it so it seems like the classic drug development, right, is like a phase one all comers. So is it changing so that like you land on AML for your disease of interest because there's a, a need for new drugs? But then it's not really a phase one, right? You're almost doing a rolling phase one two at the same time because you're choosing. So is that kind of more the way it's going as opposed to testing the antibody on a bunch of different tumor types? Yeah, so some, it depends on the, um, some molecules, the phase one is, it is just like all comers, like it's solid tumor all comers. Yeah. yeah, and then, yeah, or it's, it's more of a, yeah, phase one, two, I guess. We often skip phase two. I, 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 I noticed that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I guess, it, is that just in the trying to get the drugs through faster, and so, like part of the cynicism that I have is, are they choosing something like AML because it's such a crappy disease and we have no other options, and so you're moving it faster as opposed to kind of working more systematically. Um, so then that, I guess the other question is like, you, you kind of decide to move this drug forward knowing that there's a potential for serious toxicity. Yeah. So then do you run parallel, like as you're tweaking the drug and the linker, do you run parallel anti-tumor studies and a rat model or a mouse model or the monkeys just to make sure that the drug still has efficacy in that species that it did initially? Or do you oh, just skip you that like, and you're like, oh, well, we're going to try and use uh, You mean like has the material yeah, lost just its like potency you, or something? Where, there, is it a binding issue as, as you're stabilizing mm -hmm. the linker and you're trying to figure out like what's the optimum way to decrease toxicity yet still yeah. have efficacy? So like you do all these extra toxicity studies, change sort of changing the chemistry of the molecule. Do you go back to make sure before you move to humans that it still has the same efficacy as yes. the original drug? Yep. Yeah. yeah, it always efficacy is always our initial gate. Like if it fails there then there's so like no efficacy you change the drug, efficacy yeah, again and then go back. Yep. Yeah. Um, it was really just the AML scenario, it was really difficult to enroll patients. We only were going to enroll 20 patients in like a standard like three, I don't know, there were four dose escalations from our first in human to where we thought we were projecting based on modeling where we might see some efficacy and um, it took over two years to get patients really? enrolled. Yeah, because we had a lot of, we had a significant amount of patients that um, uh, passed away before they could get on study. Um, and there's a lot of competition in the space, so it, it was hard. So we set, you know, gating criteria for us. Like if we see five out of 18 patients that have X percentage of blast reduction, then we're gonna move forward. Then, you know, then we can move forward into a phase three or go because phonetic lax and, you know, azacitidine are gonna be the standard of care now we have to combine with them somehow, so we run another trial, a phase one trial, and yeah, so, yeah. Just following up on Rob's question. Yeah. Um, so, the, how big is the pathology group in Genetech, and what, what are the skill sets that you would look for? If you were hiring a young veteran pathologist, what, what are the skill sets you look for in such an individual? Um, so in our group, there are, so there's two groups of pathologists at Genentech. There's the research group and then the development sciences group. So I'm in the development sciences group, which is basically the toxicology group. Um, our group is only DBMs. Uh, they won't, Genentech won't hire you. Uh, they won't hire a DBM if you don't also have a PhD. Um, you have to be board certified uh, because we have to sign, right, documents that go into regulatory submissions and those health authorities require that we be board certified. Um, lab animal path is a real plus. I honestly don't know how you could do this out of the gate with no lab animal path exposure. Um, uh, you really do need a PhD. Um, yeah. Um, for this, I actually, my advice would <laughs> be I mean, if you wanted to go into a job like this, I would work at a contract research lab for a couple of years so that you get exposed to a ton of different studies, a lot of different lab animal species, learn how to read tox path studies, and then you do something like this. Because I think having that background is really valuable. 
but I mean, people don't do. I didn't do that. <laughs> in in, in so retrospect, yeah. <laughs> but it's. I mean, I can see like like I really relied on a more senior pathologist that was hopefully doing the primary path read when I would go out to these different contract labs. Um, so because it's it's different than diagnostics where like. We contract out these studies, a pathologist at the contract site reads the whole study, makes the report, assembles all the data, and then like I go out, peer review the study, and then you know we have to come to consensus and agree on the findings. Um, so there's a whole lot of like interpersonal skills that has to come with that because there's not supposed to be any sponsor undue influence because it's actually the contract lab's study, it's not Genentech's study. So they're, respons they're ultimately responsible for the way the study is interpreted. Other questions? So, uh, one last question. Yeah. So, so as you sort of with that osteosarcoma um, sort of I don't know, plan trial, yeah, so yeah. As, as you think about sort of about about doing versions of this, that big approach to for the young validation um, in, for in humans, as you start to think about doing that in effectively doing that in dogs or sticking with that. Yeah. If you think about doing it specifically for companion animals, like where along this very complex lots of animals, very expensive process. Where do you think that process could be tweaked given the limitations of working in the process? And then you're specifically looking at, okay, say for example, you're looking at an institution and you want to test that as a season of the long term. How do you, you look at that? Yeah, like how do you look at that differently if you're dealing with the constraints of a you know, better population, like a spontaneous model yeah. kind of client only populations? Um, I think we often will think about Go using, we we'll often think about uh, compared, like whether it's comparative oncology or like orthopedics or something. Um, uh, model, if there's no good preclinical model for um, efficacy, so another example would be pain. Like, there's not really good pain models uh, in animals, um, uh, experimentally induced pain models. Um, and so what a group of us also had thought about using dogs with osteoarthritis to try and just get an early read on whether or not there's any benefit or effect in these, in these animals. Um, so it's, I think it's looking for um, PKPD kinds of things. Uh, efficacy is a little bit harder because it's a longer readout. But if you're looking for target modulation from like gene expression or something, that could be a quicker answer. Um, yeah, and there are, like, we're exploring some partnerships with animal health organizations that, like, if we lend you our expertise about some, you know, antibody immunotherapy um, and what we know about, like, giving them help with the long, with the real depth of um, antibody engineering Genentech has, like, can we help you engineer a canonized antibody that we can use uh, in trials that we partner with you guys at Minnesota to run, so yeah. But we think about that kind of in that early efficacy yeah. stuff. I, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. No, yeah, so I was just curious to yeah. about how you translate that skill set yeah. to traditional endpoint human to treat to novel endpoint dog. Kind of. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I urge our, our, our audience to, to fill out the assessments. That certainly helps our committee in their evaluations.